This is the Unearthing Art Podcast with Michelle Luminato and Beck Lee, where we dig into the messy reality of making art that matters, raw and real conversations about being an artist, navigating the creative process, and expressing our honest and sometimes weird selves. We've been talking, Michelle, um, about this idea of the authentic core, you know, this underlying perspective that you have of the world. It's a kind of culmination of the different experiences you've had, different talents and skills you have, and how that uncovering that and really getting into that can be a rich source for our artistic practice and provide a real grounding for us. And it occurred to me, probably because of some stuff that I've been working through, (laughs) it occurred to me that I don't know if sometimes we get the impression or maybe hopefully optimistically assume that in the process of getting to this core, that when we find it, whatever it is, when we find um, something to ground ourselves in, that it's going to be a happy, rosy experience. But actually, I think there's a number of ways that isn't always the experience. I think that um, sometimes what you uncover can feel, and maybe it's really not surprising because it is the process of uncovering something that for some reason you're not in touch with it can be confronting it can be difficult and maybe what you find isn't what you wanted to find it isn't what you thought you wanted your art to be about and there can be like in my case I think at times I've worked my way into particular areas and then felt blocked or stuck because it felt difficult to work through and then I assume therefore that that's the wrong path and I want to flip over to something that feels more like a a flow and a natural easy thing to deal with but then maybe the real rich stuff is in that more difficult you know it takes a little bit more work to unearth the gems. I think that sometimes we yeah, we, we can have this illusion that like, oh, everything's going to be cool. I'm going to discover this thing about myself and and I'm going to love it. It's going to be so much fun. But it's actually sometimes a little bit confronting of like, mm-hmm. oh, this is a little weird. I'm And w- really what we're saying is like, ooh, does that make me weird? And how is this going to be perceived? And all of that stuff. Is that what you're speaking about? As always, there's a, a couple of different layers because I know on one layer there's sort of the, the subject or the topics that we address in our art. Um, I think that when we start to get more honest about what we're really interested in, mm-hmm. um, that then we can start to have fears about how that will be perceived or, like you say, what that says about us or it doesn't fit necessarily the maybe perhaps idealized view that we have, which could easily mm-hmm. have come from our culture or from outside about what is a good thing to be exploring in your art. And to be more explicit, um, I guess things like you might think, well, a good thing to do is either to make, um, it might be about having beautiful art or speaking to the things that are very beautiful and fun and and pleasurable about life yeah yeah and optimistic and positive give me something shiny don't show (laughs) me dirty dark stuff I know yes that's that's so it's it yeah I know what you're saying and at the same time I'm like but it's the dirty gritty stuff that's the juicy stuff you know but it (laughs) is uh, in my opinion in my humble opinion because you know life isn't full of roses you know Mm -hmm. you don't see the highs without the lows and I think that as an artist um, being honest about that is actually really what's rich you know Mm -hmm. but it does it's a little it can be a little confronting I definitely know my own work um, I've gone through this process of really discovering work that I really love and when I first saw it like two years ago I literally was like oh, this is weird. This is so weird. I'm going to go hide you for a couple years because I like you, but you're going to make me look weird. Like I literally felt like this is weird. No one's going to get this. I'm weird. Put this away, (laughs) which I look back and think, how crazy is that, that I was instantly painting that picture without letting it breathe and 
paint me a new picture of what that could look like. I think weird is a word we use a lot to describe this kind of uneasy feeling about yes. things. Yes. Is there more like why you thought that that work felt weird. weird or looked weird? <laughs> yeah, you know, like it's. I think it's conditioning. I don't know. I could be wrong on this, but I think there is this conditioning of like um, making work that people can understand feels more safe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my mom and I have very, very different tastes, and this is so against the grain of what she would have wanted for me as far as like the real abstract stuff um which is crazy because i'm now 53 and i don't need to worry about you know the 16 year old and me trying to please my mom but i think there's this conditioning that we always it's like this past experience comes up and just grabs a hold of us and says well, this is what happens in the past when you've done this kind of, like, you know what I mean? Even though it's yeah. not that exact experience. But this is, again, where I think part of the experience for me was really getting comfortable with my own voice and what that really looked like. Mm. Um, you know, and I know this sounds a little bit silly, and I've mentioned this probably before, but, like, you you want to know how you like your haircut and how you like, you know, your eggs cooked and, and simple things like that. But when you start realizing what your actual art looks like and what you're really into – getting comfortable with that um, in a way that you can stand by it. Because again, when you go present it to the world, like if you're not comfortable with it, then certainly other people aren't going to, it's not going to see the light of day, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. there is a level of getting comfortable with saying, yeah, this is how I like things. And yeah, it looks a little bit unusual. Like it's not you know, normal or pretty or in other cases, maybe dark or, you know what I mean? I think it's a great connection that you said there about speaking up, because I think when we think about speaking up just for our own preferences or our own perspectives in the way we see the world, that is perhaps a more taking art out of the picture, just very simply speaking up in day-to-day life. Even there, you can see how easily we just don't say it. It's easier just to stay silent than to say something that would feel like it makes us a a target or a, sorry, not even a target. Um, That sounds really strong, but something that I think like the terminology is putting your head above the parapets, Mm -hmm. like putting your head above the castle wall where I guess that is a target, (laughs) you know, making yourself (laughs) making yourself seem unusual. And there's that um, tall poppy thing, which I think is an Australian culture thing. Whereas if you are seen to be making yourself stand out in some way, then it's immediately kind of perceived that you are making out that you're, I don't know, more important or then you're someone that needs to be brought down and you know, made part, cut down and part of the tribe. (laughs) Because being that I'm, you know, I came here being married to an Australian. I didn't grow up with the tall poppy. Can you, I'd love to know more about that because for me, I'm like, how did, how does that happen? How does it, for standing out and being different, and here's my personal experience with standing Mm. up. Like when I had red hair as a young kid and I got teased, I wanted so badly to have brown hair and like brown hair to blend in to the whole entire world and not necessarily stand out. So I had um, I had this, you know, instant withdrawal experience because my hair made me stand out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was my experience, but I did not grow up in a culture um, that necessarily did the tall poppy the way you're describing it. So where does, what do you think that, tell me more. I'm really curious about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm a- <laughs> I just need to know a little bit more. I'm not a sociologist, um, so I don't even know why this is a part of our culture per se. I don't know. Is it inherited from the British culture or do Brits have a different approach? I don't even know that much. But as a I, kid, what, what made you aware of it is what I'm curious. Like what stories were being told that you were like, you know, don't go above, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, you just didn't want to be a show-off, really. I guess there's a lot of phrases around there, like being a show-off or um, getting too big for your boots or, um, and 
it's just implied. There's no don't get too big for your boots or it's just implied something terrible will happen after that. It's never specific what's going to happen. <laughs> just so that it was. Is, but doesn't, <laughs> isn't that funny? Because if you look back, you're like, get, you know, don't don't get too big for your britches. Like, what does that mean? I mean, maybe as a kid who's a four-year-old and you're being all cocky as a four-year-old, your parents trying to, you know, cool you down and be like, hey, I'm the parent, you're not. But hmm. what does that actually mean, you know, as we grow up as adults and make choices? And I see it also as, um, so there's the idea of not kind of feeling like you're better than others or, or putting yourself up on a pedestal. Basically because it's understood that if you do that, people will try and pull you down, I guess, which is the, is the, is the thing. But um, So basically it's better to just keep yourself down and yes. that way no one will pull you down. So you keep yourself now down. Now you're getting it, Michelle. I don't okay. know why this is so, it's very hard okay. for me to articulate this, but that's exactly so correct. It's kind of like, don't be afraid of making shitty art because you're already making shitty art. You know what I mean? It's the same thing as like. Oh, that's true. Your... That's that's the lovely reversal. Like the tall poppy <laughs> thing should mean that we feel very. And yet, yeah. So how is that? You're the like, case? you're already down. You've already kept yourself down. What are you afraid of? You're already down. This is the terrible like catch 22 of the situation. Because on one hand, you need to. Um, <laughs> I can't even explain how this works, but somehow <laughs> you need to be performing and you need to like you say you can't just put shitty art out in the world you need to you can't do something unless you're really good at it but you also can't be too good at it or think that you're too good at it because if you think you're too good at it then you need to be taken down a peg so there's a very fine line that's available Jeez. you need uh, do to you see the small <laughs> box Jeez, it's like no wonder it's a tight we're tormented rope. there's it's a, a tightrope tight and honestly, this is why I'm like, look at this. Like, it, you, you can't win if you do this. You can't win if mm -hmm. you do that. Like, the boundaries are so tight. But really, those ban like, in reality, they don't actually exist. Mm. They're made up from stories that we inherit and we continue to say and we continue to reinforce. Because I think the hard part as an artist, as we know, is it's uncertain. Well, actually, life is uncertain. <laughs> Being a human is very uncertain. You know, each yeah. day, you don't know what's going to happen. We don't even know, you know, if our internet's going to hold up to finish the podcast. Like, we just, <laughs> it's very uncertain. Yeah. But yet, we rely on these um, past experiences and stories to really inform our next decisions. Yeah. I think these stories... Um, create an illusion that if we do if we follow the rules if we are good but don't think that we're too good and we do all of this that somehow that's going to protect us from the uncertainty and I think also what I'm just realizing as I say that out loud is that part of the tall poppy thing I think is about not thinking too much of yourself do you know what I mean it's mm -hmm. not even the thing that you do it's like you can um, be very good at something but you have to, at the same time, not think that you're very good at it. Okay. So <laughs> it's, basically, it's really if you keep humble and you have a little yes. humble pie, you can be yeah. really good, but you just stay humble, which I can appreciate being humble. I suppose that speaks into not being arrogant. and. But I think in contrast to, like you were saying, bringing kind of the American perspective, I think that what that translates to, which can be a little more dangerous is the idea that we can't dream too big for ourselves that we can't actually have an idea of ourselves as breaking through particular accepted ways of doing things whereas you know from your perspective the idea of having big dreams for yourself yeah. and then actually pursuing them and I think this idea of um, not thinking too much of yourself and not um, having dreams for yourself that are above your station, let's say, whatever that means, above yeah. what is accepted in your circle, um, ties in also to this idea that it's a very bad thing to be 
um, self-involved, to be focused on yourself and that you really need to be paying attention to what everyone else around you needs. And I know that overlaps somewhat in terms of what we've talked about in caretaking in terms of perhaps that women are more expected to be caretakers than to be focused on pursuing their own individual goals and visions but this feels slightly different to me it's almost that giving a lot of attention just to your own inner world is a like I say self-involved and just even that like when I say self-involved in my mind that's like a derogatory term like that has it's a lot of negative whole connotations sheet of stuff rolls to it. down yeah right. and yet when you look at it in itself self-involved involved in knowing oneself in plain terms it shouldn't actually have a lot of negative connotations it's like are you supposed to live your entire life being completely self uninvolved <laughs> completely well, and ignoring not, and your living your inner for life. who yeah, yeah living for who because and i think that's where you know the american to me who's like dream big well in order to dream big you 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 kind of need to have a bit of self reflection on what that looks like for you because mm. I've always been told if you don't dream big for yourself, you're going to be part of someone else's big dream. Yes. You know what I mean? And so I think that it's kind of, for me, always been one of those things that I'm definitely aware of. I mean, I was brought up in a family that my mom really instilled, like, you can do anything you want. You know, it wasn't, I don't remember the part of like, it could be hard. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it was definitely you Let's could do anything out. you want and yeah. just it's always been that thing of like oh I, I just never want to have regret knowing that I could do anything I want you know mm. and also knowing like do I want to have my own dream or do I want to help paint a dream for someone else mm. and as an artist like if we don't have that introspective point of view what do what are we doing with our art like what are we bringing to the table when I look at uh, you know as an artist, and I don't, I didn't always feel this way, but I do now because of the journey I've been on, as well as helping other artists. And what I see is that the more we know ourselves, the more we can contribute to the way that people can interact with our art, because they get a real connect, a connection to who we are, what our art's all about. And they're, they're coming at it from another angle. And so that's kind of serving. I think I've mentioned that before on the podcast, definitely talk about it with artists that we work with on our art is really serving people. And when we can start to understand like us being self-involved or, you know, self-reflective so that we can have a voice, that's actually connecting and serving people who are really responding to that. And without that, there isn't really that connection do you know what I mean I also think it's part of discovering some new land like discovering making headway into unexplored territory let's say yeah um without that inner reflection I think it would be quite difficult to um come up with the richer material which is what can then resonate with people and create something that's, and we've talked about this, um, being distinctive in the marketplace. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the end, the end result is you have something that's more distinctive in the marketplace, but you don't get that. This is the, <laughs> this it's is the, the irony. Yeah. yeah, you don't get that by repeating the same things. And I think that's kind of the conflict of being an, an artist as well, is that on one hand, in, in terms of what we're talking about now, is on one hand, you want to be an explorer. Well, certainly part of the pleasure of the experience for the kind of artists we've been talking about, the artists who are interested in that kind of exploring the source, discovering deeper layers, the pleasure is in that process and being surprised in the process now you can't you have that pull and yet at the same time if you look at what comes from this exploration into the unknown and you look at it and say oh that doesn't look like what I've seen before that doesn't look like stuff that I'm seeing around me therefore it's weird Mm -hmm, (laughs) and mm -hmm. therefore I must be weird well that's 
inherently contradictory, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> we want to explore, we want the new territory, but we don't want what we make to be weird or mark us out as someone who is <laughs> doing weird stuff and exploring new territory. It's, it's like what I said about being good but not being too good. Because I'm looking and I'm laughing at myself when I'm laughing too because normally I like to laugh at Beck, but today I'm laughing at myself yeah. because I'm thinking – how weird of me to actually go, geez, that's weird. Let's put that away. Because I'm like, I can't imagine putting the flame out on that work that I've discovered because I just find it so fun. Isn't it funny because we've talked about many episodes back, like very early on, you talked about how you've identified that your core value in the art making process is surprise. You always yes. want to try new things and be surprised. And then something comes out that's totally surprising to you and you're like, oh, too surprising, too surprising. <laughs> too surprising. <laughs> put a can, put a lid on that one, box that one up. That's <laughs> how oh, funny is that? So we want to be totally surprised, funny. but we want to have control over it. I think ultimately, and, and again, I really think it has all to do with the fears and the goggles from the past of you yes. know, all those stories that we instantly bring up, we're just, we, we pull from the past and we're like, let's bring up that past story. That'll, you know, inform the way I think about it. Like the last time I felt this weird was, you know, when yeah, something happened, really it didn't helpful. feel that good. <clears throat> and then at the same time, it's like, that's why I say sitting with it for a while sometimes is part of the process as a creative, getting comfortable with it yourself so that you can like slowly go, yeah, that's that's all right. We can, that's still good. You know what I mean? Like just getting comfortable in our own skin. And that's where I think it can be confronting. But I feel like there's these things that we have to look at. That's like the invisible stuff in the yeah. art making mm. that can literally squash out really good work, you yeah. know? really authentic work, really interesting work, really surprising work. Yeah. And when it when we find it and we're like, ooh, can't be good. It just it just makes you go, what story are we telling ourselves? Where what kind of experience are we referring to from our past? Because yeah. we're always referring from the past. Yeah. And 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 that we're reliving that experience. Yes. And I don't have, I claim no expertise in this other than having read about it a little bit, but it seems to me this might be related to that kind of inner child work because yeah. when I said before about um, you're asking me, where do you pick up these ideas? And I'm like, I have mm -hmm. no idea, but um, <laughs> where do you pick up these kind of tall poppy <laughs> ideas? But when you uh, pick up at an early age, things like don't get too big for your britches, and the and the what happens next isn't explicit, <laughs> but it's implied that something bad will happen. And then as an adult, you kind of have that really instinct instinctively it's built in. And when you think it through, like we just said, if I put out this stuff that seems a bit weird or is surprising, but not too, you know, I don't want it to be too surprising because if it's too surprising, dot, 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 what will happen logically as adults you can you can say well am i afraid what other people will say to, will say about it well logically as an adult that actually isn't going to kill me or impact <laughs> yes. me in any which you know what i mean we can yeah, work it through yeah. and yet this thing exists which i think is probably reliving just i don't know internalized feelings it's, it's, and reactions from that earlier time and so it's, it's kind of automatic dealing with that a little that bit we yeah. don't even like when you think about a belief, you know, it's that thing that's automatic that yeah. it's it just it's so it is so. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like it a is belief so. is yep. just is so. There is no other option. And I think that we come to an adult age with just I don't even think it's a suitcase. I'm thinking it's probably a <laughs> truckload of suitcases. A truckload of And we have things. to really yeah. be aware and kind of bring these to the surface and I think when I, I was going to say aware, unpack them you have to unpack, unpack some of those them, suitcases open and... up the suitcase wave yeah. it around see if it's really got any <laughs> air truth it to it air it out and then yeah and then chuck it if it's not useful you know and if you can't chuck it I was going to say I think that sometimes um we might think we have to somehow offload all of this stuff in order to yeah. move on 
but also there's the idea that if you can't just if you can't offload it you can at the very least by thinking through and talking through like we have it's great to say this stuff out loud with other people yeah. because then it feels to you like the end of the world and then you say it and someone like Michelle's like yeah and so what <laughs> or I say you're to Michelle here. I yeah. say to Michelle yeah. but you love surprise and now you think this is too surprise you're, just, you're right that's that's pretty doesn't pretty make silly. sense yeah and once you get some awareness of that then at the very least when that next time that suitcase pops open <laughs> and yep. the stuff comes out at you you can like oh I know I've seen this before like I know what this is this is <laughs> yeah. something that's that yeah. travels with me but I don't have to let it determine my next step I can right. go oh yeah high baggage <laughs> yeah and I think that's <laughs> gonna... part of the process is is really coming up with a new belief mm-hmm. that we can lean into that really is is toward that vision you know i always talk about my vision but i'm a big fan of if you don't have a vision it's it's like it's a map the vision is sort of like a road map like you're not going to get on a plane and just say take me anywhere you know you you want like even if it's a small vision it doesn't have to be a giant vision i'm i'm really inspired by big visions because that's just the way i was raised and i'm always pushing myself to see bigger than what I see. But it doesn't mean that if I live in those beliefs of where I am today or the things that, you know, is my suitcase and it flares at me, I can't just stare at it forever. It won't like it's, it's, I'll just be stuck and frozen in time. So it's really, Mm -hmm. again, like sometimes it is just staring at it for a while, but also knowing like, you can either throw it away or pack it up or get a new belief. Totally. And I think it ties into, um, I'm not sure if we've even used the word fear, but I think that's what mm-hmm. comes up. It's a real kind of instinctive, primal feeling of fear when that suitcase pops open and that story, kind of a like a, a fear story that we've picked up along the way that if we do this thing, whatever this thing is, if we stand out too much in the world if we say things that are different from what other people are saying if we bring out stuff that's too surprising and too weird then something bad will happen some undefined bad thing and what we're talking about now is that we recognize that that's happening and then rather than saying staying stuck in that fear and allowing that just to overwhelm us hopefully getting to a stage where if not getting rid of the fear at all because hey we're human and we all have these fears and we're all inconsistent and imperfect and we have stories and we have baggage and we have junk um but and I think this ties back to what you were saying um when you said you were told that you could do anything you wanted but no one actually mentioned how hard that could be I think part of the hard stuff is working with fear as in yes it can be traveling along side by side with you. And I really love what you're saying there about having a vision as well, because I think that can be really powerful. And that ties in into what you were saying about being of service to people, because I think a vision that can help a lot of people, that's helped me and I've seen other people, you know, really grab onto this is when you're in that moment of feeling fearful and feeling like, oh, you're being too self-involved or you're doing something that in your upbringing or cultural education feels a bit dangerous the vision can be how can me being brave in this moment help someone else who might also have that experience but they're they're still living Mm -hmm. in the fear you know Mm -hmm. what I mean like they're still Mm -hmm. stuck in that and seeing someone else bring it out and say yeah this is weird but hey life's weird yes like how and and reverse it and think about how uplifting that is to you when you see others doing that it's like a really wonderful exactly you know that's where you get uplifted in your life and you can be that for someone else and they can be that for someone else and it's just a really beautiful way of looking at how we share ourselves in the world. Do you notice how it's not as eye focused as well? It's like yes, yeah. you're really understanding the power of your act 
whether it's bravery and what you're doing or whether those, you know, artwork pieces are connecting with someone, whatever that is, that is all around how the other people are affected by that and impacted yeah. in a positive way. And again, positive way, I don't mean like it has to be positive, shiny work. It can be mm. anything. It doesn't have to look a certain way. I think that, um, yeah, it just removes us being so I, 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 you know, and that's why mm. I always feel like one of the things we, one message I feel like we didn't get enough of as kids is you got to put your own oxygen mask on first. That's in exactly order to what I was thinking. Help other people yeah. via whether that's your artwork or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing in the world. Like if you can't put your own oxygen mask on, you know, as we know with the airplanes, you can't save the little kids next to you. <laughs> so yeah. you've got to yeah. help yourself. So I think that as artists, think, yeah. we have to learn to do that. I'm sure I've read quotes and, and smart people have said uh, things around the idea that when we can feel a bit despairing about the state of the world and stuff that's going on, mm -hmm. um, it's important that, and it's, and it's not selfish, that if the more we can also heal and become more whole in ourselves, and that's what we're talking about, about knowing ourselves and not having this self-judgment or judging parts of ourself as weird, the more open and loving we can be in the world. And the more of those types of people there are in the world, yes. the better the world can be. So there's such a ripple effect from all of that, you know, and again, it goes back to that original, like, what are we doing in that moment? Are we you know, stepping into bravery, or are we going to completely withdraw? And what I want to also add to this, which is a little off topic, um, but I know that a lot of people are thinking about it, so I want to bring it up, and that is that the world is, for the past two and a half, probably going on three years, painting a pretty glim picture of what's going on in the world. And, and you know, the news is so full of negative Um and you never see the news come out with like 10 positive things that are happening in the world. It's always about like the worst. And there's a lot of bad stuff happening. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm mm. also saying like there's a lot of stuff that is really positive that's happening in the world that we can easily think it's not happening mm. because we don't see it in the mainstream media. As humans, we're always wired to, you know, have that fear like oh what should we be afraid of you know yeah. and where's the and danger we, where's the danger where's the danger and i'm like honestly maybe it was from being a 9-11 but the minute i was a part of the 9-11 experience i realized that if i stayed focused on the danger i would be stuck forever because i was mm -hmm. paralyzed in that moment and felt completely like it was just very very it was a very scary experience that could have easily had me stay focused on that fear and that scare. Mm -hmm. Like I literally was told by my boss at the time, hey, you're going to get on a plane and go overseas. Um, I was living in New York and I was supposed to go to London and I had to get on a plane in like four weeks after that. I was terrified. And at the same time, it was like, you know, I just had to keep moving through those things. So mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is... <clears throat> These things that are happening around us they're, that are terrible, like if you're feeling in, inspired to do something about those things and you can do that, it's good to, to use that energy. Yeah. But it's also good to realize there's also good things out there, you know, and we can easily stay stuck in the fear of things or we can focus on how we can make a difference that's positive for the future. And that's what I choose. I'm just saying that out loud because I just feel like it's one of those times that it needs to be that, said. That sounds fantastic. This is a quote that I found helpful around these topics of fear and feeling like your art may be too much in one way or another, too weird or too surprising, as Michelle and I talked about. This is a quote from a writer and psychotherapist, Dennis Palumbo, and I'll put the book details in the show notes. His book addresses writers, but I think it's clear that this applies equally to all artists, so I've adjusted the wording. His advice is about those anxieties, doubts and blocks that we have that we may think we have to cure ourselves of before we can make art. 
And I think it also applies to those parts of us that we judge as being not pretty or normal or marketable enough and therefore feel that we need to cut out of our art. He says, Each of us lugs around enough baggage to warrant the name Samsonite. It's the trait we share with every other human being. Our stuff is who we are. Our hopes and fears, loves and hatreds, fantasies and habits and prejudices, and favourite movies and the way we tie our shoes and whether we like asparagus, and on and on and on. That's us, human beings. One particular subset of human beings, artists, have all the same stuff as the rest of the tribe, except for the need and desire to make art about it. If I, the artist, put my stuff aside so I can create, what's left to create with? My stuff is the raw material of my creating. I hope that resonates. We'd love to hear more about your experience, so do come chat with us on Instagram at unearthingart. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Mm